little bit quiet and subdued, I notice. Uh, so, welcome to uh, uh, post brunch on Wednesday, uh, one of my favourite slots of the EMIC uh, uh, conference. And I'm, I'm proud to have uh, led the organisation as chair for the last 12 months and very proud to be able to call this conference uh, mine. Um, it, not completely all mine, but mine. Um, and I think it's been fantastic as I. As I uh, as we go into the final furlong. I think the agenda has been uh, uh, brilliant. I think the plenary sessions have been uh, superb and we've got one exciting one uh, to look forward to. And whilst we've had uh, record numbers in attendance, somehow it's, uh, it's felt a little, a, a little intimate, which I think uh, has been excellent. It's had a good feel and a great buzz, so uh, I shall remember it for a long time. Um, I, I have one final duty, and, and for some in the room, it, it, it is the most important one, uh, and that is to recognise uh, our Best in Show awards, of which we have two. And uh, the first I would like to uh, announce is the Best Small Stand. And uh, this is particularly significant since it's, uh, it's a first-time exhibitor, so uh, uh, great effort. And that goes to Farcroft, so if they'd like to come up. So that was the small winner, and we have a large winner. Uh, and this is not their first time exhibiting, and I know they've tried very, very hard to win every time, and finally they've done it. So uh, well done to JLT. Well done, and there's some straws for the whole team. Um, so just a final word uh, of recognition. Uh, I nominated to charity 12 months ago, about now, uh, and uh, they've been uh, handsomely supported throughout the year. Um, and it's made a game-changing difference to them. So I just wanted to thank everybody who's, uh, who, who supported me. Uh, and finally, last but not least, uh, this is it. I'm done. So I'm going to take my badge off and there's somebody far better than me coming up now and it's Clive Clark. So your new chairman, Clive Clark. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, uh, and thank you for that, uh, that warm welcome. Uh, when I was uh, awake quite early this morning, and it wasn't coming back from the, the Zurich Do, I hasten to add, actually, um, I saw on the news that, uh, that Bernie Sanders, when he was uh, standing on the, on the stage, got uh, a standing ovation for minutes and minutes and minutes, and he stood there quite patiently, uh, willing to speak, and he was the one who was ultimately going to lose, so uh, thank you for being quiet very, very quickly. That's very kind of him. <laughs> So I say good afternoon and, uh, and my sincere thanks to, to Patrick and my hearty congratulations, Patrick, on the excellent job uh, that you've done as chair uh, for us over the last 12 months. And um, I'll touch on uh, some of your achievements uh, in a little while. So when I was uh, considering how I would uh, open my speech, uh, I floated a number of uh, uh, ideas past uh, my wife, actually. And as we all know, there's no one quite like a spouse to keep you, uh, keep you grounded. And after the second or third idea, she turned to me and said, listen, Clive, don't try to be clever and don't try to be funny. Just be yourself. So you were in for the ride of your life, but unfortunately, not now. So. Now, for those of uh, you lucky enough, as, as I was, to see uh, Adele's recent tour, uh, they'll know that when she uh, uh, arrived on stage, there was a huge picture uh, behind her uh, of just her closed eyes. Uh, and um, as she started the, the words of her signature song, Hello, uh, the eyes opened, uh, which was a pretty, 
a pretty clever, uh, clever trick. So it won't, suppose, uh, won't surprise you to know that, uh, unfortunately, Emic doesn't quite have the budget for that. And actually, uh, my eyes after last night's uh, Zurich Fest event uh, are probably a little bit too bloodshot to be, uh, to be honed in on. But uh, well done, guys, for that event. It was, uh, it was first rate as well. Um, some of the words from, from her song, actually, uh, struck a chord with me, actually, and certainly um, the uh, hello from the other side. And, and I feel that I am very much on the other side because I've sat in the audience uh, many times, been, uh, was, was totting up, actually, some sort of uh, 10 conferences, I think, that I've been to, which is a relative kind of beginner, I think, to, to many of you um, out there now. But... Um, I do feel like uh, a novice that's now actually been promoted to the honourable position of chair, and, uh, and I take great pride in that. Um, up behind me, uh, when I actually get round to, to clicking it, is um, a slide, hopefully, that I can find, uh, which is a bit of a new... Uh, not that one, but maybe another. But, uh, OK, if we can't find it, that's fine. I'll leave it back on that one. But there was going to be a slide, anyway, that depicted the speed of technological change uh, within life and industry. And what will be obvious uh, to us all is how quickly the fourth industrial revolution is coming, and some may say has actually arrived. Um, with other revolutions, uh, they've taken maybe 100 years, and we've seen this industrial revolution uh, come in nearly uh, 50. Now, Emic recognises uh, this revolution and the relevance of it, and you should look out in the next 12 to 18 months as we're going to do a significant uh, a bit of work on that. So back to Patrick, and uh, he said that uh, this will be the most favourite part of his speech, but uh, he has led the association actually with drive, vigour, and an exceptionally clear focus on putting you, our members, at the heart of everything that, uh, that we do, and all credit to him. He's driven Emic to be the best that it can be, and I know that you will have noticed, as I have, the difference that he has made, actually, but I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that, that I, you know, that he's done. He's uh, initiated a series of uh, strategic activities to ultimately grow the business and further engage uh, with our members. He's driven the risk agenda, leading to the first uh, ERM forum. And ultimately, he's driven AIRMIC to be the best-in-class membership association. So, Patrick, thank you and well done. The path to chair, actually, is uh, one of steady progress, actually, uh, with at least one year uh, spent as deputy and also as part of the executive committee, and, of course, a number on the actual board itself. Uh, this process is, uh, allows you to see an input into the strategy. So we agree the strategy as a board, and it's my job now just to make sure that I help execute that uh, with uh, the CEO, obviously. Now, clearly, I'll, I'll give my opinion uh, and use my experience and assist where and wherever I can. Uh, we have some great momentum and ambitious plans to grow, and I absolutely want to be an integral part of that. I'd like to also mention and give my thanks in advance to my two deputies, uh, Paul Gordon of Heathrow Airport and Linda Lucas of Fujitsu. Uh, the current diversity and quality of the board makes for robust and, and challenging debate and discussion. I'm looking forward immensely to, to working with you all and thank you all in advance for all your time and effort that you put in. There was a really strong response actually to the three vacant uh, board positions a few months ago and it showed again to me the great respect that the position is actually held in and it's a testament to the strength of the membership that we have. Please continue uh, to challenge us on everything that we do. It's very, very important that we, that we hear from you. If you have a question, ask it. If you have an issue, raise it. And if you have a good idea, then absolutely share it. We will be so much stronger working collaboratively and as a team. There are three areas, actually, of particular interest to me, which I'd like to touch on as well. Um, we've heard a lot, and I want to emphasise again, the formation of the Leadership Advisory Board, which will enable EMIC to draw on the skills and expertise of the best in the business. The ERM Forum, that I've mentioned already, and again, the new website and customer relationship management system, which will allow us to target its members in a much more bespoke way. EMIC will and needs to stay relevant and useful to its members. Business and the world we live in continues to move and change at an ever-increasing pace. And you, our members, need to be getting the best technical papers and advice, the best networking opportunities, and keep up to date on the emerging risks. This must all be done against the backdrop of more stringent codes, 
legislation, cost and personnel reductions, and shrinking budgets in risk and insurance teams. AMIC is best in class for its technical work and will continue to be so. We will equip our members with everything they need for their careers, whether they are just starting out or as an integral member of senior management and reporting to the board. Our members need to be leaders and key subject matter experts in the business. And AMIC will also concentrate on some of the softer skills to help you achieve this. Our SIGs and committees will remain a fertile ground for industry discussion and problem solving. At AMIC, we are rightly proud of our technical guides, seminars and papers, which remain of the highest order, and under the guidance of Julia Graham and Georgina Oakes. My thanks also to Katie Moore for her contribution, and I'm also delighted to welcome her replacement, Kin Lee, to AMIC. I'd just like to take a moment again to recap and remind you of three of the papers that were launched at the conference. So they are the scenario analysis paper, and this will guide, this guide, sorry, will present a simple framework for our members to lead scenario analysis within their business. Innovation in the insurance industry uh, intended a very interesting uh, discussion this morning, hosted by Georgina. So well done on that, George. It was excellent. And this paper will identify the challenges and looks at how members might wish to take advantage of the appetite amongst our insurer partners. And lastly, uh, the use of insurance in M&A. I think uh, from personal experience, I know that sometimes we get uh, brought in very late in the day to uh, mergers and acquisitions. And this paper will not only outline the different transactions uh, undertaken by companies, but will also uh, give uh, advice on some of the management issues that can be raised. Now, some of you will be aware that John Ludlow, uh, ex of International Hotel Groups, uh, and now a risk management consultant in his own right. So a little plug for you there, John, you'll be pleased to know. So. Um, should have been standing here, actually, uh, and probably doing a better job than, than I am. But uh, due to John's career uh, taking the path that he has, he steps aside from becoming chair, but remains an extremely valuable member of the board. Now, John's view on risk and insurance is clear, and I was keen uh, to, to talk to you just for a little while about some of the initiatives uh, and the guidance from John. So John feels that it's critical, uh, and I agree, for insurance to be relevant to the board rather than a grudge purchase. Uh, risk management needs to go beyond just simply operational controls, and all areas of risk within business need to collaborate and work together in a cohesive team under a CRO. Interestingly, our pre-conference survey suggests the top concern for risk management is embedding this within organisations. But also, it says that actually getting in front of the board and gaining interest from them is something that we are able to do and have been successful about doing. As you've heard, AMIC is working hard with insurers and brokers on innovation. But let's remember, if we as the customer don't actually understand our risk and we can't monitor, manage, report, mitigate and ultimately transfer it, then if we can convince insurers to take it on and accept the risk, they will place a margin cost for that protection. The innovation, I think, is down to us to drive as risk managers. It would be remiss of me not to mention the Insurance Act, um, as we all know will be coming into effect in less than two months' time. Only Nigel, actually, my account director at Willis, remembers the Marine Insurance Act coming into law in 1906. So um, you can see how old he is because of that. Most risk and insurance managers in the room will be already cognizant of the need to disclose all material information and on the whole broken presentations for larger corporate clients will already be produced in a format which is clear, concise and accessible. Emmett was instrumental and supportive to the Law Commission in the shaping of the Insurance Act. We will continue to work with you, our members and listen about the practical issues of implementation and what they are seeing from brokers and insurers. Now, to get on to my theme, um, my theme actually is about encouraging young people positively into the uh, insurance industry or the insurance and risk industry, or perhaps a more catchy title would be investing in tomorrow's talent, rather than, as many uh, of us in the room, including myself, fell into insurance because we wanted to be bankers or traders or something that uh, sounded a bit more exciting at the time. 
Um, as some of you know, I actually did my growing up in Norwich, which was perversely one of the hotbeds uh, of insurance in the late 1980s due to the phenomenal success of the then Norwich Union and the large Sedgwick, uh, two names from the past there, uh, offices which were there. Now, EMIC will be invest, uh, investigating how it can work uh, closer uh, with further education institutions, business schools, and our partners uh, to do this. And I already know in some of the conversations that I've had with some of our partners, they're really keen uh, to, get, to get with us. So I, I will be reaching out and I urge you to, re you know, to contact me as well. EMIC is more about evolution than revolution. And like Patrick, I want it to be the best member association it can be. I want EMIC to be more personal and to encourage members uh, to reach out with their needs, thoughts and comments on what we do. My own personal story is of someone who didn't go on and do higher education, started as a filing clerk, and I'm now chair. Now, I took some risks, had some great managers, and had the drive and opportunity to succeed. And I would urge others out there and the managers amongst you to give people the chance to do the same. So in conclusion, the time is now for risk and insurance, and together, and with their support, and my contact details are up there as well, I think we can make it happen. Just finally, I'd just like to talk about my charity for the year. Now, this is one that's obviously very close to me. Uh, my youngest stepdaughter, Helen, has Down syndrome and attends a special school, Marketfields, near where we live in Colchester. I'd like to introduce you now to the school and the head, Gary Smith. Can you run the video, please? Hi, I'm Mr Smith and welcome to Marketfield School. Marketfield is a specialist school catering for children aged 5 to 16 with learning difficulties, autism and various other challenges. I'm head teacher here and have been for over 20 years now and I've loved every single minute. I really do have the best job in the world because of the dynamism and vibrancy the children bring to the school each and every day. After all, presence is more than just being there. We've recently been graded outstanding by Ofsted for the third time in a row. I think that's because we concentrate on what the children can do and not what they can't. As a school, we feel that learning should be fun and each day is an opportunity to do both. Smiling is contagious, scientifically proven to be good for you. Our ethos is mutual respect and understanding and this sets the children on the right path for life. In 2015, we've got a new home. It's a purpose-built, state-of-the-art flagship school for specialist provision. This new building enables us to take the education we provide to the very next level. But it's the staff and children that make Marketfield so special. As the great Winston Churchill said, I'm easily pleased by the very best, and I'm very pleased. Great, thank you very much for that. That was, uh, that was excellent. So that's my charity. That's my stepdaughter's school. Just a few very quick headlines. Uh, the school has nearly quadrupled in size in the last 25 years. It serves a massive learning community. And as he said, last September they moved into new premises and they've been campaigning for over a decade uh, to get those. So that's, that's what my charity will be this, this coming year. I won't be asking you now um, to dig deep, uh, but we'll save that for when I see you all again at the annual dinner uh, in December. Um, the school, just to let you know, actually will um, begin using its own money uh, to uh, change and... Um, equip their junior playground and actually in December uh, I've asked Gary if he'll be bringing some images of the before and after to, to show you what actually your money will be doing. So I think that's enough from me. Um, thank you again uh, for coming. I hope you enjoyed the conference uh, and now it's time I'm, uh, for our keynote speaker and I'm very very pleased to introduce Professor uh, Brian Cox OBE, arguably the UK's best known physicist. Uh, Professor Brian Cox's books and TV programmes have been read and watched around the world and credited with making science engaging and accessible to millions. With his down-to-earth, likeable enthusiasm, Brian is frequently labelled a rock star scientist. Once a keyboard player for Dream, he has come a long way to his position of profession of particle physics at Manchester University and a key part of the ATLAS and the CERN Large Hadron Collider projects. Brian's blockbuster TV shows include Wonders of the Universe, Wonders of the Solar System, and Wonders of Life, each looking at the fundamental science behind everything 
from stars and planets to atoms and microbiology. From speaking at TED in the US to the World Economic Forum in Davos in China, Brian's presentations engage, inform, and entertain featuring awe-inspiring images from the depths of the universe, as well as his trademark infectious enthusiasm for his subject. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Brian Cox. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to, to close the conference. I believe it's been a magnificent conference, magnificent weather. Um, also, the theme of the conference. When, when I, obviously, I'm not going to talk to you about insurance. I know absolutely nothing about that at all. But um, when we talked about what I might be able to speak about at the end of this conference, the title was it captured my imagination, new frontiers in risk, new frontiers in ideas, the risks and the benefits that new ideas bring. That dovetails, of course, beautifully with science, and particularly, I think, science today. Um, I'm going to show you three new results in the course of this talk, which are really less than a year old, that point to, I think, an exciting, probably a revolution in our understanding of our place in the universe and our understanding of nature. But um, I start with this picture, um, talking about the idea of risk associated with new ideas. Um, this is a picture, a stone etching, actually, from an event that happened in 1600. Um, if you don't recognize this man, he's quite famous, not really for what he did when he lived, but for how he died. It's a man called Giordano Bruno, who was burnt at the stake as part of the New Year's Eve celebrations in 1600 in Rome, um, mainly if you speak to historians, because he was just a pain in the ass and people didn't like him very much. But he's become famous because one of the reasons he was burnt at the stake was for his ideas. Um, he wasn't really a scientist. These ideas weren't really based on anything, but they were a challenge to the orthodoxy of the time. Uh, the two that got him into deepest trouble were an idea that he had, based on no evidence at the time, that the universe is eternal both in space and in time. He didn't think, he believed the universe had no beginning, which is a, um, a romantic notion, and we're going to talk about that later on, actually, the current view of whether or not the universe indeed had a beginning. Was there anything before the Big Bang? That's current research now again. But he got into trouble for that. And also for the idea that because the universe was infinite in his cosmology, there were an infinite number of worlds uh, with an infinite number of those supported life. And he thought that all life on any particular world was transient. So he thought that the human race itself and all life on Earth would be transient. Again, he was right in many of these ideas, but he had no real basis for them. He got it, there's a great story, it's almost Python-esque actually. You remember that in The Life of Brian where the guy gets stoned for saying Jehovah and uh, John Cleese says to him, don't say it again, you're only making it worse. And he says, how could I make it worse for myself? Um, it, it, the, um, Bruno had his tongue uh, pinioned to his lower jaw. So he had a nail put through his tongue and a piece of wood stuck on his lower jaw to prevent him repeating his heresy and making it worse for himself. How could it be any worse? He was being burnt at the stake. He could have, anyway. That was the, the backdrop, really, for the beginning of science. This is about the time of Copernicus, just afterwards, actually. So, really, the, the modern science was beginning to happen at this time, 1600. Wind forward, only 87 years, and you have the publication of the first real scientific document, which is Newton's Principia. Uh, certainly the first time that mathematics and physics came together in a coherent framework. Uh, the most famous piece of Principia is Newton's theory of universal gravitation. And it stood as a beautiful description of gravity for, well, until, in fact, uh, 100 years ago this year, 1916, or just late 1915, when Einstein completely overturned Newton's view of the universe. Um, this is instructive, I think. It's a very important point about science, about the, the reason for the success of science. Uh, Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, described science as a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance. So, and I, I love that description. It's merely satisfactory, and it's a philosophy of ignorance in the sense that you never know anything for sure 
that the journey of a scientific theory is from completely uncertain to reasonably uncertain, but it's never considered to be absolutely right. The theory of gravity is a beautiful example of a completely disruptive thought, actually, um, that overturned the Newtonian way of looking at the world. Einstein called it the happiest thought of his life. Um, so, what did Newton say? Newton, the, it's probably an apocryphal story actually, but he describes sitting in front, underneath an apple tree and an apple falling onto his head. And he described what happened as the fact that there's an attractive force between the earth and the apple. It accelerates the apple down, so it detaches from the apple tree and accelerates towards his head, pulled down by the force of gravity acting because of the presence of the earth. Einstein completely reversed that picture, even though it was so successful that essentially it found in modern science, it's successful enough, Newton's theory, to send spacecraft to the moon or to the outer reach of the solar system. It works, but Einstein overturned it with confidence from one happy thought um, 300 years after it was published, essentially. What's Einstein's picture and what was his happy thought? I'll just show you this picture of Einstein, but also in the middle there, you see a man I'm going to talk about a little later, Georges Lemaitre, and a man called Edwin Hubble, these three great thinkers who really overturned our picture of the universe at the turn of the 20th century. Einstein was interested in free fall, in the way that objects behave under the action of gravity. As I said, Newton had described it absolutely beautifully and it worked perfectly, but Einstein didn't think the explanation of what was happening, of the apple being pulled towards the earth, was satisfactory. He didn't think it was all that there is. I'm gonna show you a video, which if you saw my uh, series Human Universe was on a couple of years ago on the BBC, you may have seen it. Um, but it's a video of things falling under gravity. So pure gravity, if you like, when you take everything else away. So you see gravity, naked gravity, if you like, um, by sucking the air out of somewhere and dropping things. Air resistance is what we tend to see when we see things falling under the action of gravity. And um, we did it by borrowing this place off NASA. This is the world's biggest vacuum chamber. It's in Ohio, actually. And it was built in the 1960s to test nuclear rockets. It's bigger than the nave of St. Paul's Cathedral. And it costs $50,000 dollars to pump the air out of it which is probably why no one has ever played around and done this experiment before it's an expensive place to play around but NASA allowed us to pump the air out to watch in this case a feather and a bowling ball fall under the action of gravity so that's what you see there the feather and the bowling ball being winched up and this is a slow motion so a high speed video of that drop so all the air has been pumped out you're seeing the force of gravity acting in its purest form and you see, it's quite shocking, although we all know what will happen. We remember from school, things fall at the same rate in the gravitational field. But it's interesting and surprising to see feathers and a bowling ball behaving like that. And you see, hitting the ground at precisely the same time. Beautiful video. Einstein's happiest thought was associated with that. The, the story is, apparently, that he was watching a bloke working on a roof um, over from his office in Bern in Switzerland and he imagined him falling off the roof and his happy thought was that on the way down he won't feel anything at all. He will only be reminded that something is happening when he hits the ground, he'll be reminded quite abruptly, but on his way down it'll feel to him as if nothing's happening at all. And you see why he was interested in that because if you watch this video again um, it's possible when you see this, Einstein was imagining it, this is why he was a genius, but it's possible to watch this and think, well, actually you could imagine that the background is doing the moving. Uh, the fact that those things move in the same way as they fall to the ground would be easy to explain if they weren't moving, if there were no force acting on them, if they were just sat there minding their own business, that's exactly what it looks like. And it's the ground that's doing something. And that's why everything meets the ground at the same time under the action of gravity. That was the happiest thought of Einstein's life. Completely the opposite. Uh, Newton, if you remember, said that there's a force pulling an apple down, it hits me on the head. Einstein said, no, uh, the apple is floating, minding its own business, and Newton accelerated up to headbutt the apple. It's completely the opposite. Bold, hubristic almost idea. Turns out, though, that is correct. It's the correct way to think about it. The difficulty, of course, once you've removed the force of gravity, it's rather satisfying because you can explain why everything falls at the same rate in free fall because nothing's falling. Um, you've got to explain why planets orbit around stars, uh, what the force of gravity actually is if it's not a force. 
So Einstein thought about that after his happy thought for seven years. It's a very difficult problem to solve. I think it's instructive, though, that he had the confidence. He, he knew in his head that he was right, and he just kept going. I'm going to describe planetary orbits without a force in the traditional sense of gravity. What he ended up doing, the act of genius, other than having the happy thought, was to replace gravity with geometry. Now, how do you do that? How can you get a force from geometry. Well, that's actually quite easy to explain. If you think about walking with a friend on the surface of the Earth. So let's say you, you get, agree with a friend to stand on the equator, and you say, we're going to walk due north from the equator, parallel to each other. We will not deviate from straight lines, which is what happens when no forces act on you. So you start walking. Parallel lines on the surface of the Earth are lines of longitude. So you walk, 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 and you get closer together. And in fact, if you carried on walking to the North Pole, you'd bump into each other at the pole. So if you didn't know you were on a curved surface, you would conclude that there was a force acting between you, pulling you together. And that's essentially what Einstein replaced gravity with. He replaced it with the geometry of something. It's a thing, it's a surface in physical language called space-time. So space and time itself, in Einstein's theory, are curved by the presence of objects like stars and planets, and things follow straight lines through that curved space and time. A straight line through the curved space and time around the sun is a planetary orbit. So that's what is happening now. The Earth is freely falling around the sun, which in Einstein's language is the Earth is not being acted upon by a force. It's traveling a straight line, minding its own business, just like the feathers and the bowling balls were minding their own business. And there's something to do with the curvature, the geometry of space and time around the sun that makes it go around the sun, that binds it to it which is a kind of interesting idea. You can see, I hope, the framework, but it's obviously difficult to realize in practice. That is the realization of it seven years later. That is Einstein's theory of general relativity. Many physicists consider it to be the most beautiful theory ever written down, or the, most, the greatest products of the human mind. It might be the surprising or scary or familiar, depending on your, your mathematics and what your uh, experience of mathematics was at school, perhaps, or at university. But it's actually quite a simple thing. It tells a story. This is all there is to gravity. On the right-hand side of the equation, you'll see the thing that says T, and then the two Greek letters, mu and nu. That's the distribution of matter. So for a solar system, uh, you would put a spherical distribution of matter in there, plug it in. And the other side tells you the curvature of space and time. In other words, the story of the solar system, the paths that planets will take. Einstein did that in 1916 after publishing this equation, and he found that it described the orbit in particular of the planet Mercury more accurately than Newton's laws. So therefore, it is a better theory than Newton's. It describes nature more accurately. But then he did something audacious. This is where we get back to the theme of this kind of audacious, revolutionary thinking, shaking up um, not only industries, but actually, in this case, whole civilizations and the way they see their place in the universe. Einstein wrote to a friend of his, actually, in 1916, and said, I'm going to do something now. This is, he'd already had this triumph of describing the orbits of the planets with this picture. But he said, I'm going to do something that's audacious, and I think it might consign me finally to the madhouse. He thought it was so ridiculous that he may be considered insane. And he was worried about it, but he did it anyway. Um, and what he did was he said, well, okay, so if I put a spherical distribution of matter, a star, into the right-hand side, fine, it gives me the orbit of a solar system. What happens if I plug the matter distribution of the universe into the right-hand side? What is the story that my equation tells? What does the left-hand side say? And he did it. And I, at the same time, in fact, a Belgian priest called Georges Lemaitre had the same idea, and he did the same thing. The story that comes out when you do that is essentially this one, which is a schematic representation of the story of the universe uh, in modern language. The idea there was a, an origin in the universe 13.8 billion years ago, and the universe, has, the universe has been expanding and cooling ever since. The universe started simple, and has expanded and cooled. Uh, complex structures like planets and stars and galaxies, and indeed civilizations and people, sort of crystallized out in the expanding, cooling universe. Einstein's theory predicts that. Lemaitre 
when he got that result, he was more confident about it than Einstein. He wrote to Einstein and said, your equation implies there was a day without a yesterday. Um, which means that Einstein's equation, if you just stick in a matter distribution for the universe, I should say, by the way, you can't obviously know where all the galaxies are, so what they both did was assume that on the largest scales, matter is evenly distributed. So the universe is the same in every direction and the same everywhere you look, a Copernican principle, if you like. There are no special places in the universe. With that assumption, you get that story out. So Lemaitre wrote to Einstein and said, yeah, there's a day without a yesterday, and Einstein wrote back to him and said, your mathematics is excellent, but your physics is lousy. And the reason he said that was because he didn't like the idea of a moment of creation. It really, for some reason, Einstein was philosophically opposed. He wanted the universe to be eternal in the way that Giordano Bruno had emotionally wanted the universe to be eternal. So Einstein fiddled around for a while. He put a different term into his equation called the cosmological constant, which is in there, actually. It's that capital lambda, um, in order to try and make a balanced universe. You can't. Einstein's theory of gravity will not allow you to have a static universe. If you put matter in it, it's got to expand or contract. It's not stable, and that implies there was a beginning. It's a tremendous story because... When this was predicted, and when Lemaitre and Einstein realized, no, it's right, this equation itself, which I remember he thought about a bloke falling off a roof, and that was inspiration for writing down the equation. The equation itself predicts there was a beginning, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's the first instance of the Big Bang in modern thought, and it was entirely theoretical. We didn't even know at this time that there were other galaxies beyond the Milky Way, let alone that those galaxies were rushing away from each other. Edwin Hubble, who I showed at the start, discovered that two years after the prediction, the experimental verification began to come. So it's quite a remarkable story. And if you think what we've learned since, this is 1927, 1928, not long ago, just 80 or 90 years ago. Now we have precision measurements of the size and scale of the universe, and we sort of accept that story. Um, I wanted to show you this, which is a visualization of our most high precision map of the local universe. It's called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So every point, obviously, you can see them here, is a galaxy. It's a mapped point of a galaxy, so the data's real. Um, obviously, it's a computer fly-through, but the positions of the galaxies are real. And you see that there's a, a snowstorm of galaxies. When you think that every one of these galaxies has, on average, 100,000 million suns in it, and we now know that virtually every one of those will have a solar system around it with planets orbiting around them. And you see that there are rivers and flows of galaxies, a snowstorm of galaxies. We uh, have measured that there are of order 350,000 million galaxies, 350 billion galaxies in the observable universe. And the observable universe extends, uh, the real universe extends way beyond the bit that we can see. How far? We don't know. It could be infinite in extent. And I'll get to that, actually, at the end of the talk. How big could reality, could the universe really be? But you see that even the bit we can see is kind of big enough. <laughs> There's plenty of room. Um, one of the great challenges, actually, in modern cosmology is to work out why those structures are the way they are. Why are there clumps of galaxies? What is the origin of that clumping? I'll mention that as well at the end of the talk. But you see, it's a remarkable step. This is in one human lifetime from knowing of only one galaxy, the Milky Way, the one that we're in, and not knowing whether the universe had a beginning or not, to building a theory that describes the beginning, to understanding that there was a Big Bang, and then to mapping the observable universe. And because that was a visualization, I want to show you a real picture, just to underline this sense of scale of reality as we know it now. This is, if you're an astronomer, you'll know this picture. It's one of the most famous pictures in astronomy. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Image. So it's taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's an image of a piece of sky you would cover if you took a five pence piece and held it about 70 feet away. So you imagine a tiny piece of the night sky um, chosen uh, for this image because there's nothing bright in it from the surface of the Earth. So no bright nebulae, no galaxies, nothing spectacular. But the Hubble took a, uh, well, over many years, actually, it's been going back to this piece of sky, taking long exposure photograph after long exposure photograph. And this is the latest publication of it. There are over 10,000 galaxies in this image. Remember, five pence piece, 75 feet away. The most distant, which are the redder ones, are over 13 billion light years away. 
which means they formed really shortly after the Big Bang. So the light from many of these galaxies actually began its journey to us, traveling at 186,000 miles a second before the solar system was formed. It's only the closest ones that the light has had time to travel to in four and a half or five billion years or so. So again, the scale of the reality we've discovered in the last 100 years has been remarkable. But Bruno's challenge still appears to be incorrect. Um, it looks as if uh, Einstein's theory predicts that there was a beginning. Um, we have experimental evidence. There was a big bang. I'll mention some of it a little later on. And we, don't, we only know still, to this day, of one world which harbors life. Um, I'll get to that as well. Just one more thing, though, before I move on to life in the universe and the origin of the universe. I thought I'd just mention a bit of, I told you I'd mention some new data just because it's exciting. Einstein's theory, as I said, 101 years old this year, came out of the mind, really, of one physicist. It's very unusual that physicist, physics is usually a, a communal uh, sort of uh, pursuit involving many people. Einstein wasn't that. But you may have read of the discovery of gravitational waves, um, which was a confirmation, again, of Einstein's genius and the brilliance of his theory. Let me just mention what that was. It was made by an experiment called LIGO, which is actually two experiments, or two pieces of measuring apparatus. One in Louisiana, which is this one, and another one in Washington State, the other end of the United States, which is this one. They're both identical. They're basically rulers made by laser beams, four kilometers long at right angles to each other. So you see them there. Um, their job is to measure ripples in space and time. Ripples in space time caused by violent events somewhere out there in the universe. So quite literally, um, when something happens, when masses move around in the universe, you get ripples in that fabric, the geometry of which is what Einstein calculates. And they move along at the speed of light, like ripples on a pond when you throw a stone in. And if you have very accurate rulers, you can detect them. So the idea of this experiment is you'd see something, this ripple in space and time, uh, that actually Kip Thorne, one of the theorists who, who thought up this experiment, called it a, a storm in time. So you see a storm in time coming from some event. It passes through, let's say, Washington State first and moves the rulers, changes the, the rate that clocks tick as well as distances as it sweeps through these laser beams. And then it passes through at the speed of light. So a little time later, passes through Louisiana. And you see a signal, and you see a signal. So you know it's not local vibrations or anything. You know it's cosmic, because you can measure the time difference between the signals. What these experiments did last year was measure a very violent event. And this is a plot from the paper they published, actually. They measured the collision of two black holes. That's what they observed. Now, these black holes were big black holes, about 30 times the mass of the sun, each one, 30 times the mass of the sun, compressed and collapsed into something, well, essentially, as far as we know, a single point, so smaller than that, 30 times the mass of the sun, orbiting around each other, spiraling in towards each other. One of the interesting things about this, if you look at the scale on the graph, it says time, you see it says 0.3 of a second to 0.4 of a second. So this happened in one-tenth of a second. And what the, the plot above there shows the closing velocity of the black holes. So they started off spiraling in, approaching each other at a third the speed of light, 30 times the mass of the sun. One tenth of a second later, they were going at two thirds the speed of light, and then they smashed together to make a big blob 60 times the mass of the sun. That shakes space time up a lot and the, ray, the waves went rippling out, and the middle there shows, well, that the red line, it says numerical relativity, is the calculation from Einstein's theory written down in 1915, published 1915, 1916, and the gray thing is the observation of the storm in time that passed through these detectors, and you see it's a perfect description. So another triumph of Einstein's theory. The other thing to say is that this is the beginning of a new phase in observational astronomy, because we can see things that you can't see with light alone. The whole history of astronomy has been observing light from things. Dust obscures that. The early universe obscures that. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but these gravitational waves pass through everything. So the possibility is there to observe events that happened at the Big Bang, at the origin of the universe, by measuring the gravitational waves. So it's a terrific, very important measurement. So I mentioned that Bruno's challenge seems interesting at the moment. We seem to have a finite universe, certainly in time, and we only know of one planet where there's life. We're talking about disruptive ideas. Um, 
paradigm shifts, essentially. One of the great disruptive changes, I think, in astronomy over, over my lifetime has been the realization that there are worlds out there which can support life, not only around distant stars. We now have measured that there are of order 20 billion planets that are potentially like Earth in the Milky Way galaxy alone, using a telescope called the Kepler Space Telescope. But also that even within the solar system, there are habitats for life. And I just wanted to show you one recent measurement from October last year by a spacecraft called Cassini that's uh, revealing that even the most barren little lump of rock or one of the most barren in the solar system might be a candidate for having living things on it today in our solar system. I'll show you this picture, by the way, because this is when I was born. It's my first Christmas Eve, 1968, Apollo 8 on its journey around the dark side of the moon. The moon looks barren, the earth, this is the famous Earthrise picture, the earth looks blue and inviting in the distance. This idea of barren rocks other than the earth was absolutely the paradigm when I was born in 1968 because we hadn't been beyond the solar system, oh, well, sorry, beyond the earth very far. We'd been to Mercury, we'd had a look at Mars very briefly, we hadn't been to the outer solar system at all. We started to go into the outer solar system in the mid to late 70s with the Voyager spacecraft, essentially, launched in 1977. And when we got there, we found uh, worlds that we couldn't have imagined. They were nothing like the dead, barren moon, that paradigm of moons being lifeless that we'd imagined before. This is one of the, every picture you look at from Cassini is remarkable. Uh, this is one of the more recent ones, Saturn and its rings. Those rings are water ice, by the way. They're about 100,000 kilometers across, but about two meters thick. So they'd comfortably fit into this auditorium of end on, where they'd stretch out 100,000 kilometers. It must be a remarkable sight. See them there casting a the shadow onto the, the gas giant Saturn. But this is one of the pictures that Cassini returned in October last year. Um, it's a picture of a spectacular picture of a moon over the plane of the, of the rings. Uh, that moon is called Enceladus. It's a small object. It's about the size of whales, actually. So a very, very small little rock in the frozen reaches of the outer solar system. But when Cassini zoomed in and looked at it, it found something very interesting. Um, it found these features which are called the tiger, tiger stripes, which seem to be active geological features on its surface. So you see them as blue there. They look like fault lines. And when Cassini flew close in over Enceladus, which it's done several times, but the last close flyby was in October last year, it took pictures like this. So this is a flyby over that moon. Again, quite a small, rocky object. Any astrophysicist 20 years ago would have said it would be an inert thing. But actually, as you see, there's geological activity. Those are eruptions of water ice. So they're liquid water being ejected out into space through those tiger stripes and uh, freezing as soon as they go out. There's actually so much material ejected from this moon that it forms a ring around Saturn called the E-ring, uh, the Enceladus ring, as it were. So what are those things? Well, Cassini has been able to measure what's been happening in those eruptions, and this is the new data. It turns out there are particles called, well, silicon nanoparticles, silicates nanoparticles in there, which form in salt water when hot water meets rock in a saltwater ocean. That's how they form. Also, simple organic molecules have been discovered in these things. The spacecraft was not designed to make analysis like this, so we don't know in detail what's in there. But it looks, for all the world, like those are coming from what structures called hydrothermal vents. Now, this is a picture of a hydrothermal vent system on Earth. It's called the Lost City. It's on the mid-Atlantic ridge, the fault line that runs down the Atlantic. Um, these places, you produce these silicate nanoparticles. It's hot water in contact with rock. The interesting thing is that these are the most likely places, many biologists think, for the origin of life on Earth. So the cradle of life on Earth is probably, or in many people's opinion, places like this, where there's hot water in contact with rock. The idea is that probably around four billion years ago, or even earlier, in some primordial ocean, this is where the chemistry of life began on Earth. And we've now found these conditions almost certainly on at least one moon in the solar system, Enceladus. So that points us to the fact that it would be an interesting place to go back 
with a dedicated biology mission. The habitats, the potential habitats for life are getting more numerous the more we look. As I mentioned, the Kepler Space Telescope, if you look out into the galaxy, this is a photograph, by the way, of the star fields at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Hundreds of billions of suns. And we now know, as I mentioned earlier, that at least one in 10 stars and possibly one in five or even more than that have rocky planets around them as well as gas giants. We're discovering rocky planets almost every day. Thousands and thousands of planetary discoveries have been confirmed. And then even within solar systems, the moons of planets in our solar system certainly look like they might be able to harbor life. So maybe in that sense, Bruno, Bruno's heretical idea is beginning to make sense. At least it looks like there are plenty of worlds out there where not only life, but possibly, if we're lucky, civilizations may exist. But let's go back to the start. I talked about the origin of the universe, uh, the Big Bang, the, the idea that the universe is finite in time. What can we say about that? It's one of the most common questions I get asked when I go into schools. Uh, what happened before the Big Bang? Can we say anything about that? Well, we're certainly investigating what happened just after. We're, accelerating, we're, we're, we're um, investigating that with machines like the Large Hadron Collider. So <clears throat> you'll have heard about the LHC, of course. It's very famous for the discovery of the Higgs particle. Here it is, 27 kilometers in circumference. Uh, it ex sits between, uh, most of it's in France actually, the bottom half of this is France, but the top half is Switzerland, that's Geneva Airport runway at the top, 27 kilometres in circumference. Its job is to accelerate particles to 99.999999% the speed of light, collide them together 600 million times a second. In each of those collisions you recreate the conditions that were present less than a billionth of a second after the Big Bang so we can investigate the physics. And that's what we've been doing for several years now. You know that we discovered this interest in Higgs particle there. Also, um, just mentioning spin-offs, I haven't mentioned spin-offs yet in the, the quest for understanding the universe. I just want to show you this because it's interesting, unexpected ideas coming from unexpected places. Uh, this is a friend of mine who's the press officer at CERN, collects old documentation, and this is one of his favorites. It says, information management, a proposal. You see that it's written by this bloke, Tim Berners-Lee. It says, what is it, March 1989. The interesting thing about this, when we're talking about assessing the possible impact of new ideas, is his manager wrote vague but exciting on it and gave it back to him. So he didn't really know what this thing was going to be. This is the first proposal for the World Wide Web, of course, which has revolutionized all our lives. But it came from a very modest idea to share data between particle physicists. But the reason I wanted to mention CERN is to show just one little, one graph which is a so-called preliminary result, um, which was published last year, so it's a public result, um, but it's extremely interesting. We're taking data now at the Large Hadron Collider, and we hope to confirm whether this little result is real or not. What you're looking at here is a plot, which is essentially we're looking at two particles of light being produced in these collisions, and what you're looking for is a bump in the data, because bumps signify new particles. And you see that there is a bump. You can just see it there. It's around the 800 on the, on the scale on the bottom there. That bump signifies potentially a new particle, uh, way heavier than the Higgs particle, in a completely different region, completely unexpected. On this preliminary result alone, there have been over 200 different theoretical papers published suggesting what this might be. Now, it's important to say this isn't confirmed yet. We need more statistics. It could be a statistical fluctuation, but it's, very, it's interesting enough for many people to think, well, there's a hint of something. What could it it be really genuinely unexpected. It's an example of going into the unknown with a piece of scientific uh, apparatus and just searching for the sake of it. If this is there, it could be anything. It's one of the classic signatures of extra dimensions in the universe, for example. The idea there are not three dimensions of space, there are more dimensions of space than that, four, five, six, and we just can't see them. This is one of the signatures. Also, it's one of the classic signatures for something called dark matter, particles that we suspect very strongly are out there in the universe, but are not the particles out of which we and the stars and planets and galaxies that you can see in the sky are made out of. We don't know. So it's one to watch. By the end of this year, either this little bump will have gone away and it will just be statistics, or it will still be there and it will be a revolutionary discovery. If that's there, it is completely unexpected. So I just wanted to give you a, a hint of why the Large Hadron Collider is getting more exciting, probably, rather than less exciting after the discovery of the Higgs. 
And in the last minute or so, or two minutes maybe, I want to go back to that Big Bang. What happened before the Big Bang? Let's see if we can rescue Giordano Bruno. And this little picture, I've showed it several times, is the origin and evolution of the universe. The interesting bit from our perspective is that thing that it says afterglow, afterglow light pattern, 375,000 years after the Big Bang. The idea is that as the universe expanded and cooled, before that time, it was too hot for atoms to form. So it was in a form which is called a plasma. So it was too dense for, it was too hot for atoms to form, which meant that light couldn't travel through it. It was too dense, essentially, and electrically charged for light to travel through. So light didn't have a long path. So the universe is opaque. So we can't see anything before that time using light. After that, at that moment, as the universe cooled and the atoms formed for the first time, the universe became transparent, light could travel through it, and it's been traveling through it ever since. And so we can take a picture of that moment with satellites. There's one called the Planck satellite that's up there now, and this is the photograph that it took, the latest photograph. So this is, if you like, it's a, it's a picture of the entire sky, which is why it's that shape. It's like the celestial sphere. So it's a sphere um, unrolled out like a map of the Earth. And it's a baby picture of the universe, essentially, the oldest light in the universe. What you're looking at there are regions of different, very slight different density in the early universe, as it was about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So the red regions are slightly denser than the blue ones, very slightly. It's actually uniform to one part in 100,000. So it's extremely, it's what physicists would call homogeneous, very, very smooth, very, very similar, but with tiny different variations in density across the universe. Those are important because they led to the formation of the galaxies. So all those structures that we saw in that Sloan Digital Sky Survey fly through of the data of the galaxies can be traced back to density fluctuations in the early universe. And remarkably, when you do computer simulations, so you stick this in and use Einstein's theory of general relativity and wind time forward from this point, you get a distribution of the galaxies from this data that matches what we see in the sky. So we understand beautifully how those galaxies came to be the way that they are. It's a remarkable triumph. The question, of course, is given that these things, these little fluctuations are so important, they formed, you know, the that they are the seeds of our existence, in a sense. Where did they come from? And the answer is that we do have a theory where they came from. And in my last minute or so, because I'm just overrunning a bit, I'll tell you what it is. It's called inflationary cosmology. So the idea is that we can trace the universe back to when the entire observable universe with 350 billion galaxies in it was compressed into something not only smaller than an atom, but about a billionth of the size of an atomic nucleus. That's how good our theories are. So we can track this, the, the evolution of space and time from a billionth of the size of a nucleus out to the size that it is today. Um, what happens when things are a billionth the size of a nucleus is quantum theory takes hold. You get little ripples, everything's popping in and out of existence all the time in accord with quantum theory. Those ripples, according to the theory, got frozen in to space and time when the universe expanded exponentially fast in a time before the Big Bang. And when you put that theory into practice and do computer simulations, you get out a distribution of ripples in the universe that matches this precisely. So it works, the theory. It tells us the universe was doing something before the Big Bang. The Big Bang is an event in a pre-existing universe. So the universe is expanding exponentially fast. That exponential expansion stops for some reason. And in stopping, the energy that was driving this rapid expansion of space and time apart gets dumped into the universe. That's what you see as the Big Bang. It heats up, and the particles out of which we are formed today get formed at that point. So then the question becomes, OK, so that works. It matches the data. How long was that thing going on for? We have a measurement back to the time when that stopped. It's called inflation. And that's our 13.8 billion years. How long was the inflation going on for? The answer is we don't know. Uh, we don't have a measurement of it. We have a minimum time. And it's something like, in scientific language, 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So that's 0.000, 35 noughts, one of a second. So not very long. So there could have been a mother of all big bangs that somehow started that off. But 
Some of those theories suggest that that's not right. That's a minimum time. In fact, some of those theories suggest that maybe that thing could have been going on forever. And more than that, it doesn't just stop all at once. It stops in patches. So that would suggest that our Big Bang was a tiny event in a pre-existing universe and only in a patch of that pre-existing universe. The rest of it carries on expanding exponentially fast and then some other patch stops doing that and you get another Big Bang and another Big Bang and another Big Bang and another Big Bang. So this in, is called an inflationary multiverse. These theories suggest that there isn't only one pocket of the universe like ours, but in fact there are an infinite number of pockets of the universe. They're still being produced now and there will be an infinite tree of universes that essentially could be eternal. That process of the creation of universes could go on forever, which is back to Bruno again. It's a very interesting theory. The interesting thing is, though, it makes predictions that, whilst not fully tested, can be tested by data like this. So Bruno may have been right. The universe might be eternal. There might even be an infinite number of not only worlds, but an infinite number of universes. Let me leave you with this. We've got a bit of time for questions. But when thinking about these things, we might live in an infinite sea of universes that's been around forever. Uh, what does that mean for us? John Updike, one of my famous authors, once said that um, cosmology, astronomy, is like theology. But the terrors are less, but the comforts are nil. I'll leave you with that. I would say questions, but thank you very much. Thank you. We've, we've got about, I should say, we've got about five minutes for questions. I have to stop at uh, 1, 9, uh, 1 25, I think. So if anyone's got any questions on those terrifying ideas. There's, there's at least uh, there's one down here and I have to, there's some microphones coming and I have to say that's number one. Okay. So that'll be number one and then number two. So. It's okay. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, when the LHC was switched on, there were some excitable press reports that it could destroy the planet or the universe, um, which I assume you treated with sort of the same contempt you reserve for astrologers <laughs> and some people's views on the death of strawberries. Um, <laughs> However, it's arguably a very good example of a frontier of risk. Yeah. How do you risk assess an experiment involving something like the LHC, bearing in mind the unknowns that you've talked about, and also the changes in theory from, say, Newtonian to Einstein, uh, which I think you said yourself was a revolution. Mm. And now we have dark matter and dark, dark energy, which appears to be more than 90% of everything, um, and is certainly a mystery to me, but probably not you. Um, but how against that do you assess risk? It's a good question. And so, sorry. Oh, yep, it's a very good question. And the answer is that there are two ways, but the main way is data. So um, the main argument, well, one of the two main arguments against the fact that something unexpected can happen in LHC collisions is that collisions of that energy are happening all the time in cosmic rays. So we're being hit by particles from space with energies millions of times those at which we collide particles at the LHC. And we know very precisely how many. We know the flux of cosmic rays. So we know how many high-energy particles are hitting this roof now, for example. Um, and we know how many have done that over the history of the Earth. And it turns out to be a lot, a measurable number, but billions of times the number of collisions will generate at LHC. So you can say with confidence that if nature has a surprise at these energy scales, then uh, that would have already occurred, not only on Earth, actually, but on the Moon and on Mars and on every surface you can see. And if we look at across the universe, we see no evidence of any collision in, instigated by these ultra energy particles that causes anything interesting to happen. So that's number one. So we did that with, with cosmic ray data. There are also theoretical arguments that um, if you can make, let's say, mini black holes, which is what people are interested in. By the way, that, that measurement that I show um, could be a signature of the kind of physics that would let you make mini black holes. So that, that's always a possibility. But on theoretical grounds as well as the data grounds, if you can make them, then that means that essentially it means that our understanding of the theory of production is, is reasonable enough. And essentially the theory is to do with Hawking radiation, which is what Stephen Hawking is famous for. So the idea that if you can make them, they evaporate is actually very well founded um, and is 
th that would explain to you why if you are making them in cosmic ray collisions, which you will be doing now above our heads, if they're makeable, we're making them. They're being made. They're coming through this room, probably, if you can make them. They're not doing anything. Uh, and the reason probably is because they evaporate if they're there. And that's uh, what Stephen Hawking got famous for. So there are two. But I think the main, the main proper argument is, is cosmic ray data. So and number two. Is there a way I could donate to your charity, your cause, for what you're doing? Well, we could certainly chat about that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, thank you. Well, I'll talk to you about that afterwards. Thank you. Uh, do you have one back there? We've got about one minute. There's one right on the end there. And then I think then I have to wrap up because I believe your, your, your buses are coming. Yes, it's flashing. It says one minute 30. It should be a quick one. Um, where is light travelling to? So if we're, uh, for this image behind you, for example, we've witnessed that uh, in light, as you say. Um, is that light travelling, obviously, on a, on a path? Oh. Or is that... Where, yeah, it's where, the, where is it going once it's past us? <laughs> well, it carries on into the universe. Do we, and know, um, do we know how far? <laughs> well, it, it, it's the, it will travel for as long as there is a universe, unless it hits something. Uh, like our detector in this case, in which case you absorb those particles of light. Um, so that's the, it, 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 that's actually a glowing, it's, it's like a, you can imagine it like a, a sun. It's like a, a hot, it's, the, it's literally the universe glowing and emitting light off in all directions uniformly. And we, we'll always see that when, when we're looking, we can, we can capture that most distant light because we're always seeing that time in the universe. There's one, there's one very quick one there. Just, uh, I'll just get the, the... At the periphery of the diagram there, um, the light that's travelling outwards from there, where, where is that going? Oh, no, yeah, um, the, so this diagram is, is, is the, the celestial sphere. So, so the edges are not... The, it's the edge in the way that a map of the Earth would have... It looks like Greenland's on the edge, or Antarctica's on the edge. There are people on the internet who think that, by the way, but, um, <laughs> but so, so that's, that's a, a 2D representation of the celestial sphere. I think what you're asking, though, is, is how the, the, however far you look back, so, so that light passes us, um, and then we see another slice of it, and another slice of it, and another slice of it. The, the idea is that the universe w is, is much bigger than the bit we can see. So, so there, there may be, well, well, be no edge to the universe, but there is an edge to it in time, as it were. But what we're seeing is the universe 13.8 billion years ago. And then in, in a billion years' time, we'll be looking out, we'll see the universe as it was 14.8 billion years ago, which will look the same because it's the, we're looking at a fixed time in the universe. It's quite hard to picture that. But the, the picture about the idea about an edge is there isn't an edge. It's just because we've, we've put a map of a sphere onto a, onto a flat piece of paper. I think that's it, because it says uh, plus 54. So let me just say, uh, th thank you again. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Brian. That was uh, just a fantastic uh, journey uh, across the universe there. And it only remains for me to say that our journey for next year is not quite that far. Um, it's in Birmingham from the 11th to the 14th of June. And uh, the same pride that uh, Patrick had about this conference, I look forward to having at that conference. So safe travels, everybody, and look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>